1918, uh, two years before American women were granted the right to vote, uh, the women of Texas were granted the right to vote in state primary elections. Didn't happen until two years later for the whole country, but in Texas, it happened in 1918. Here's a group of Texas women waiting to register to vote for the first time in July 1918. They're getting ready to register to vote in a Texas primary election. This is a flyer from around that time, making sure women knew they now had access to the ballot box in Texas. Women! Not a great flyer? Look at that. Women, the eyes of Texas are upon you. Have you paid that poll tax? Poll taxes were still a thing back then. And again, this was for voting in a primary, not in a general election, but this was Texas in 1918. And Texas, for all intents and purposes, was a one-party state. It was controlled by the Southern Democrats, a very different party from the Democratic Party as we know it today. The Southern Democrats basically won all the elections in Texas back then. So voting in the primary was basically like voting in the general. Whoever won the Southern Democrats' primary was basically guaranteed to win the general election, too. So it was a big deal. When Texas ahead of the United States as a whole. Texas welcomed women to the ballot box in 1918 to vote in state primaries. Except there was a hitch, a really, really big hitch. This is Christia Adair. Back in 1918, Christia Adair was 25 years old. She was a young suffragist living in Texas when the state granted women the right to vote. And so the day of that first primary, when Texas women could turn in a ballot for the first time in the state of Texas, Christia Adair says she got dressed up to go vote. She was a voting rights advocate. This is, she was somebody who had been agitating for women to be allowed to vote. Women can vote. She was there. When she got to the polls, she was not allowed to cast a ballot. This is Christia Adair in 1977 explaining what exactly happened to her that day. Watch this. The white women were going to vote and we dressed up and went to vote. And when we got on there, well, we couldn't vote. They gave us all different kind of excuses why. So finally one woman, a Mrs. Simmons, said, are you saying that we can't vote because we are Negroes? And he said, yes, Negroes don't vote in primary in Texas. So that just hurt our hearts real bad. Negroes don't vote in the primaries in Texas. Let's throw that picture up there again. Those, those Texas women in their cute hats and their long skirts all registering to vote. These women, of course, are all white. Because in 1918, Texas held all white primaries. No person of color in Texas was allowed to vote or run for office in a primary election. Only white people were allowed to do that. This was post-Reconstruction America. This was the era, absolutely, of poll taxes, of literacy tests. This was Jim Crow. This was an era of white people in power using overt, unapologetic influence to prevent black people not only from running for office, but from voting. And this is one of the ways they did it, by holding explicitly all white primaries. They said they were protecting the purity of the ballot box. That was as far as they went in terms of code, right? Banishing black people from the right to vote for the sake of the purity of the ballot box. That kind of language was ultimately enshrined in the Texas state constitution. Quote, in all elections by the people, the legislature shall make regulations as may be necessary to detect and punish fraud and to preserve the purity of the ballot box. The purity of the ballot box was about having all white voters in primaries, all white primaries. And all white primaries are not just a Texas thing. They happened in other states, other southern states, too. But when people talk about all white primaries, they're usually remembering Texas because Texas is where the all white primary first began to fall. In 1940, an African-American dentist named Lonnie Smith tried to vote in a primary in Houston, and he was turned away because it was an all white primary. But then with the help of the NAACP, Dr. Smith sued his lawyer assigned to the case was a young lawyer, turned out to be a very talented young lawyer, lawyer named Thurgood Marshall, who, of course, would go on to become the first black justice on the United States Supreme Court. And that case, that case of that black Texas dentist, in fact, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled eight to one that Dr. Smith had the right to vote in the Texas primary, that the idea, this rule in Texas of an all-white election was unconstitutional. The majority ruling 
uh, reading in part, quote, the United States is a constitutional democracy. Its organic law grants to all citizens a right to participate in the choice of elected officials without restriction by any state because of race. Constitutional rights would be of little value if they could be thus indirectly denied. The next day, April 4th, 1944, this was the headline in the New York Times. High court rules Negroes can vote in Texas primary. Denial of right to vote because of race violates the 15th Amendment. That ruling had, remember, <laughs> this is 1944. This is not ancient history. This is 1944. And that ruling had huge implications all over the country. There were all white primaries all over the South, but after that ruling, all white primaries started to fall like dominoes. It's a landmark case. Thurgood Marshall called it the most important case he ever worked on. And so in 1944, Dr. Lonnie Smith got his chance to vote in his Houston primary. And so did Christia Adair and all the other young women who got dressed up to vote that day in 1918 and were turned away on account of the color of their skin. All white primaries in Texas took a long time to die, but they died. The reasoning behind them, that bogus justification to preserve the purity of the ballot box, that language about having all white electorates for Texas primaries, that sentiment still lives in the state of Texas today um, in some ways. Right now, a sweeping voter suppression bill is working its way through the Texas legislature. If signed into law, the Republican-sponsored bill will radically restrict access to the ballot box in Texas in a way that all observers and experts say will disproportionately affect voters of color. And for the Texas Republicans who wrote this bill, their reason for writing it, literally what they called the stated purpose of the bill— Will sound familiar from page one of SB7, the big voter suppression bill that just passed the Texas House. Quote, purpose. The purpose of this act is to exercise the legislature's constitutional authority under Section 4, Article 6 of the Texas Constitution to make all laws necessary to detect and punish fraud and preserve the purity of the ballot box. To preserve the purity of the ballot box, the language from the Texas state constitution that was put there to try to protect the Texas ideal of all white electorates, of all white voters in Texas primaries. Purpose. This year, purpose. To preserve the purity of the ballot box, as it says in our Texas state constitution. Last night, the Republican-controlled House in Texas uh, passed that bill restricting voting rights in the state of Texas. The vote happened in the dead of night, three in the morning last night. Democrats threw every legislative maneuver but the kitchen sink at that bill to try to slow it down, but it passed just after 3 a.m. One of the most striking moments of the night, though, came when a Democratic lawmaker confronted one of the sponsors of the Republican voter suppression bill, confronted him to ask him if he understood what he was doing when he and his colleagues wrote one particular clause into this bill. Watch this moment. You chose a... A, a, a peculiar term in drafting this bill, and you talked about preserving the purity of the ballot box. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a quotation from the Texas Constitution, to be Article 6, Section 4. Right. And are you aware of the history behind that provision of the Constitution? I'm, I'm not. What was your motivation for using that term purity at the ballot box? Because that's a specific set of words that has a lot of meaning in state history. Well, what was uh, your intention? I'm going to answer for you. You know, you, you, you may have figured out by now, I really like the, the state constitution. And, and I think um, as a legislative body, just as Congress should, they should be looking for their authority from, from their charter, from the thing that gives them power. And so when we're looking at what authorizes us Right, the sovereign people of the state of Texas who, who delegated their authority to the, through the Constitution, we then should look to the Constitution and say, what gives us authority to do anything on this issue? And, and that's the provision that, that does that, and so that would be why. Did you look at, at, at the history before using that word? No, no. The only thing, if we were to have a, a discussion, maybe over some coffee or a drink, someday I could go into the details of, of Article 1 really well. Um, I've read the debates in the journals of the Convention of 1875 on that, for, for that thing, but I'm not familiar with the, the you one. May, on you may have missed it Article then. Six. Uh, 
um, and, and this would have been very obvious, I think, to anybody who looked at that and looked at that language. And that provision was drafted specifically to disenfranchise black people, mm. black voters, in fact, following the Civil War. Did you know that? No, that's, that's I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. And are you familiar with white primaries? I've, we've, we've heard and read of such things. I'm glad have you that's read about gone. those. It's a disgusting thing. Yes. Did you realize that that purity of the ballot box language in the Texas Constitution gave rise to all white primaries? No, no, I didn't. And did you know that this purity at the ballot box justification was also used during the Jim Crow area to prevent black people from voting? No, no, those are, those are troubling things. I, I didn't know that was their, their Did reason. you know that in states across, across the country that penal disenfranchisement schemes were put in place, including in Texas, as far back as 1845, to effectively lock African-American people out of the political process? Are you aware of this history? You know, um, I, I think we said a few times that I, I wasn't aware of um, any kind of malicious intent in the use of that term. Okay. And the reason it was used is I looked at the Constitution because I believe our authority is derived from the people, and that's why. Gentlemen, it sounds expired. That young man is the guy who wrote the sweeping new voter suppression bill for the state of Texas, including its purity clause, which comes from Texas's history of all white primaries, ensuring all white electorates, segregating the electorate by race. Uh, They did struck the purity phrase from the bill late last night when they apparently learned for the first time where that came from. The heart of the bill stayed there, though, uh, stayed intact, easily passing the Republican-controlled House. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.